people in good quality jobs. So would you please welcome the Midtown Scholar to discuss his new book, Getting America Back to Work, Stuart A. Cobb. Thank you very much, and thank you, Eric. Uh, I want to thank uh, you and Catherine uh, for uh, allowing me to come be here tonight. And I want to thank my friends Rick Smith and Lorenzo Canizares for helping put this together. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, and I'm going to talk for a little bit. I'm going to do a, a reading from the book and then uh, I'm happy to sign any books that anybody wants to buy. We are, of course, in the deepest uh, economic crisis we've been in in this country since the Great Depression. And the thing that we can't get over, that we cannot seem to fix, is that is consumer demand. We cannot generate enough consumer demand to drive the great American economic engine. And I believe that's because for 30, 35 years we've had either stagnant or declining wages for America's working folks. And so I want to do just a couple of readings from the book, answer any questions anybody has, and then uh, I'll be happy to sign any books that folks want to take home with them. Chapter 2 says, America works, but only for the financial elite. Who are they? When most of us think of rich people, we think of the power shopper down the street. That person, just like you, is a pauper compared to our real kings and queens. Look at these numbers and you will see why. In 2007, 14,588 people in the United States, about the same number as live in a medium-sized rural community, average $35 million a year. Compare that to your paycheck. Even though the economy was called fundamentally sound during the 2002-2006, uh, the financial elite raked in three out of every four dollars of America's income growth. The financial elite raked in three out of every four dollars of America's income growth. The rest of us saw virtually no income growth at all. The average person on the 2009 Forbes list of the 400 wealthiest Americans was worth over three billion dollars. How much is that? Three billion dollars is a stack of one dollar bills over 200 miles high. The federal budget deficit is projected to be something like $1.6 trillion. The Forbes 500 could stage a fundraiser that would come close to paying that off without in inviting anyone but themselves. There is no way a person can spend that kind of money on cars, houses, boats, and college degrees. So what else does membership in that in this most exclusive club brain, power. Power to get around the rules that most of us must live by. Power to go way beyond that. Power to change the rules most of us must live by. This is what we mean when we say things like money talks or joke about the Wall Street golden rule. He who has the gold rules. It is what Senator Richard Durbin meant when he said, and the banks, Hard to believe in a time when we're facing a banking crisis that many of the banks created are still the most powerful lobby on Capitol Hill. And frankly, they own the place. It's one thing to own a house and quite another to own Capitol Hill. This, in short, is the difference between what the ordinary person, even the ordinary millionaire, can buy and what our economic royalty can buy. Many people, with good reason, think it's outrageous that so few people should be so unbelievably rich while so many others dwell in poverty. Some of these people are motivated by religious concerns, others by a simple sense of fairness. We will respectfully put those concerns aside and ask only this question. Is vast wealth concentrated in a very few hands good for the economy? The answer is no, it is not. Our economic history shows that the financial elite 
do a great job of feathering their own nests and a terrible job of running a middle class economy. If we are going to get America back to work, working for ordinary Americans, we will need to get money and power back into our hands. And then I want to read the first chapter. Maybe you are out of work as you read this. Surely you know someone who is. Maybe a family member or a close friend. The dimensions of this tragedy are something most of us have not seen during our lifetime. Something like one in five American workers is officially unemployed, is among the so-called underemployed, or has given up on ever finding work. The consequences of so many people out of work are overwhelming. Millions of Americans can't make their credit card payments. Foreclosures and underwater mortgages are becoming the rule rather than the exception. One in eight Americans is on food stamps. 47 million of us go without health insurance. Retirement dreams have become retirement nightmares. Our decade of disaster has caught up with us. The first decade of the 21st century brought zero job growth. How bad is that? Every decade since World War II has ended with at least 20% more jobs than it began with. Income for working and middle class families has been stagnant since 1980. Since 2000, that income has actually declined. Family wealth has tanked. Put another way, during the decade of disaster, America officially stopped working for ordinary Americans. Instead, America worked only for a handful of unbelievably rich, unimaginably wealthy, powerful individuals. Jobs went offshore, factories were closed, debt replaced paychecks, and tax breaks went to the super rich. We, just, we didn't just fall into this mess. For the last 30 years, America's working families have endured an assault by the financial elite specifically designed to slash, slash our wages and benefits, lower our standard of living, and shift wealth and power from those of us in the middle and at the bottom to those at the top. So here we are. In the middle of the biggest economic uh, disaster most of us have ever seen, with two big jobs on our hand. First, we need to get Americans back to work. Second, we need to get America back to work for working Americans. We can't do one without doing the other. How do we turn things around? We must begin by recognizing that our economic problems, and this is probably the most important point in the book. We must begin by recognizing that our economic problems are the result of intentional, sustained, strategic, public policy. Bad public policy cooked up by the financial elite. The good news is that in a democracy, people can change public policy. That's what this book is about how we change public policy to get people back to productive work and to get America's economy working for working families. We must understand and then act. The first part of this book lays out the economics behind the decade of disaster. We explain this relationship between wealth and power and why we have to build more power to change things. Don't let the word economics scare you. We left the gobbledygook at the university and wrote in kitchen table language. Then comes the action part. We will show you how to put more power in the hands of working families. Using that power wisely and strategically is the key to getting America back to work. And my, my co-author is uh, Richard Levins. He's a professor emeritus in economics from the University of Minnesota. And he's probably the best person in America to explain uh, difficult uh, economic theory to average Americans and, lay and laypersons like myself. 